You know that we're continuing our series, working our way through 1 Thessalonians. Those are hard passages that you heard read this morning, aren't they? Okay. Um, I want you to do this. I want you to put your hands like this and just hold them in your lap. And whenever I say something that steps on your toes, just squeeze a little harder. Can you do that? Because I'm going to step on toes this morning. It stepped on mine as I wrote it. (laughs) For two years, we lived in Helmstedt, Germany. Now, you probably wouldn't know it by that name, um, but it was also called Checkpoint Alpha um, when Germany was, was still divided. Do any of you remember that? Am I that old? I'm that old. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, I feel better. Um, It was a very small outpost, but it was part of a bigger brigade that was always in the world spotlight, the Berlin Brigade. And because it was such a political hot spot, there were frequent military reviews, parades of military power and might like you used to see in the newsreels, in the movies. Do you remember those? Okay, those didn't exist anymore by the time we lived there, but they existed overseas where we were living. Um, you could tell when one of them was about to come up because baby oil would disappear from the PX. They used it to polish the tank turrets so that they would literally shine as they rolled down the street, and it gave off the image of a well-oiled uh, military machine. That's exactly what it was intended to do. That sense of always being on review um, carried over into our everyday lives as well. Because we were representatives of America and of that particular brigade, living in a foreign country, the concern always had to be held, kept in in top shape. Um, And because my husband was the commander, our house and grounds also had to be kept in top shape. If you've ever been in my house, you know that I'm not Betty Crocker. So it was a stretch. Um, There were constant social demands Um, and things to be aware of in every single situation. We were invited to everything that happened. Um, Some of those things were with the German community, some with the French, some with the British, and some with the Soviets, depending on the political climate at the time. So we were on constant display, too. My preparation for that time was really rapid, and it was quite simple. The former commander's wife spent a day or two with me walking through a list of do's and don'ts before she left, instructions that were meant to prepare me to represent the brigade well. As a a not-quite-yet 30-year-old, that was terrifying. That's part of the reason for Paul's writing to this young church in Thessalonica. See, they've not had much preparation time as a church before Paul and his companions had to leave. And as a brand new church in a pagan society, they were individually and collectively on display for the kingdom of God. And they needed to know how to handle that responsibility well. In chapter 4, as you heard Thelma read, Paul addresses individual responsibility first. He writes this, It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Now, sanctified means holy, pure, set apart, consecrated. It's a process that begins when we come to know Jesus Christ and doesn't end until we look like him. For most of us, that's going to be when we get to heaven. Now, Wesley actually believed that you could hit Christian perfection in this life. I'm not there. Trying. To explain what part of that process looks like, Paul uses an analogy. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 8, he talks about Christ followers as clay vessels, clay pots that have this treasure hidden inside us. And he picks up that idea in verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians. Most Most versions of the scripture use this idiom, each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, there it is, in sanctification and honor. Why? Because what the world sees is that vessel, right? That phrase is actually a euphemism, and here's where it's going to get uncomfortable, that has to do with how we handle our sexuality. It was particularly important because the Thessalonian culture was even worse than our culture is today. Just about anything was acceptable, and Paul writes, that should not be true of you. Rather, each should master his or her own body. One, because what we don't master will master us, right? But two, how we handle our sexuality affects our witness. That witness is marred, for example, when we take advantage of others by having sex outside of marriage. I told you to get uncomfortable, didn't I? (laughs) Premarital sex robs the future marriage partner of the virginity that should be brought as a gift to the marriage. 
It also damages the future relationship of partners, even if they get married, because there's a trust that's breached when that precious gift is taken before commitment is made. And that trust is really difficult to regain. Adultery harms a spouse and a family. And Jesus himself said that to even look at someone lustfully was to commit adultery. Now, those are pretty high standards, aren't they? As a society, we've fallen pretty far from them, haven't we? In 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, Paul reminds us that because we are vessels of Christ, we're one with him. Therefore, our bodies are not ours to do whatever we want to do with them. And he finishes that part of the instruction with some pretty harsh words. God did not call us to impurity. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction doesn't reject man, but God. Ow! Think how different that is in the society we live in. Having dealt with a difficult topic, Paul moves on to something the Thessalonians have excelled in, their love for one another and for other Christians. And there is no greater witness than to love. And by the way, when the community around you thinks of St. Mark's, that's what they see. They know your love because of the things that you have done. You've invited them to dinner. You've invited them to be a part of us. You've gone out and you've prayed for them. They see those things and they know your love because of it. You are a community who loves. In verses 11 and 12, Paul finishes his encouragement to each of the Thessalonians with these three fa- fa- she can talk. phrases. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. And quiet's a term that means to be at peace. If we are constantly frantic, running around worried about this and that and angry about this and that, then our witness is what suffers. It's one of lack of trust. A quiet peace, however, is evidence of Christ within. And that's a powerful witness. It's not a witness of denial, but rather the witness of trust in the midst of every circumstance. Second, Paul writes, mind your own business. If you read through 2 Thessalonians, we find that some of the Thessalonians, assuming that Jesus' return is imminent, had actually quit working. And they were spending their time being busybodies within the community, spreading gossip instead of Christ. And Paul writes, stop it! Third, he says, go back to work. And that will win the respect of others. And then you won't be dependent on anybody else. He actually says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if a man won't work, he shouldn't eat. That's what the word says. Yeah, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but let's do clarify it (laughs) so we don't take it out of context. Um, Paul's writing here to people who have deliberately quit working and are sponging off of others when they are able to work. Now, there's a communication there that we are expected to work, and Ecclesiastes reminds us that work is actually a gift from God. Part of the purpose is so that we can take care of ourselves. But 2 Corinthians 9 adds that we should also work. There's a further obligation there so that we have something to help those in need. Galatians 6, 1 through 4 brings all of that together in saying these things. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. That is, when there's a need, we're to step up into it, aren't we? He goes on to say at the same time, each one should carry his or her own load. So we need to be careful not to enable, but to help when real help is needed, right? To the point that that people are able then to pick up and to carry their own load. That's not something that we hold in contempt. That's something we're called to do as a body, isn't it? This is where you say yes. Or I can go back through the whole thing again. I'll be glad to do that. (laughs) All of those things together, our sexual lives, the way we love, our work ethic, our social ethic, Paul writes, will make each vessel shine with God's light. In that way, you possess your own vessel. Does that make sense? All right. Now, the second thing that these young Christians need desperately to understand is what I was talking to Avery about. That's the safety and the support that the church is intended to be in a foreign land. Hebrews 11 reminds us that we live in a foreign land as citizens of another kingdom. This isn't home anymore. Our citizenship is in heaven, and Christ is returning someday. Lord, thank you to take us to be there with him. The church then on earth is an outpost 
of the kingdom of heaven. And our common task is to bring the reign of God to bear in this part of the land in which we live. We pray it every week. Your kingdom come, your will be done. When we come to chapter 5, this part of Paul's letter is written to the church as a whole. But the sense of possessing your own vessel is still present in it. In 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5, Peter writes that together, each of us as stones, Avery, maybe he was thinking about your bricks, but interestingly there, that word can also mean shaped stones, jars, or vessels. Um, we're being built into a spiritual house, a place that Christ dwells within. So not only does he dwell within each of us, right? But he also dwells within us as a body of Christ. So when we're together, that light ought to be brilliant, so brilliant it blinds. Let it be, Lord. His presence should be visible then, too, in the way that we live together. In chapter 5, verses 12 through 13, Paul writes that we should respect those who have been placed in authority over the church. And he concludes that passage with these words, live in peace with each other. Now, he writes that specifically to combat an attitude that's prevalent in culture. And it's actually prevalent in our culture, too, so this is important for us. This is the background. In each place that Paul started a church, he placed believers from that new church in authority as shepherds over the flock. In some cases, it's quite clear that the church had a hand in choosing those whom they recognized to have the Spirit of God in them as shepherds. They were people that they came to trust. Now, you know, because you've read the Bible, that shepherds are intended to be servants and protectors in that they mimic God the Father and Jesus the Son, right? Yes. But remember, much of the Thessalonians' view has been shaped by their culture. And the tendency of Thessalonian society was very much like America's today. We are stubbornly and fiercely independent. You don't need to tell us what to do. Thank you very much. We're skeptical of others. We often mistrust motives. We're even cynical about others who appear to do good. And you can say amen or ouch. It really doesn't matter because truth hurts, doesn't it? That's who we are. Our media, have you noticed, foments that attitude. Oh, the church is just trying to control you. You want proof of it, take a look at Yahoo's homepage. The church is always doing something or saying something that they, want, they feel free to take pot shots at, as if the church is theirs to command. Who is this the church? It belongs to Jesus Christ. It's not theirs, and by the way, it's not ours. It belongs to Christ. I should quit preaching. Paul was writing to the Thessalonians there who have this same mindset, and he says, no. Those leaders have been set in place to protect you as a flock and to remind you how to live together in love. And the intended effect of the shepherd and the shepherded working together is to live at peace with each other as we all follow Christ. And this is the reason. Because then the community is a safe place. It's a refuge. It's a fortress, as we heard us talking about. Consequently, then it becomes a safe place for others to join in. Does that make sense to you? Paul continues by identifying some specific ways that the church is to help one another grow in love. He says, first of all, sometimes the rebuke is in order. That doesn't sound a bit safe, does it? Mm -mm. Verse 14 says, admonish those who were idle. And the term idle there is used of soldiers who are both careless and who insist on doing their own thing, marching their own way. Now, if you've ever been a, a part of the military or police or any group that's tasked with keeping the peace, you know that you're trained to fight together so that in combat or in dangerous situations, you know where other people are. And you know how they're going to respond so that everybody is kept safe so far as possible, right? One that won't do that, carrying out that role, but instead chooses to do their own thing, is downright dangerous to the others. To borrow a picture from history, when the Romans advanced, do you remember that? They raised shields up over their heads, and those shields locked together so that they formed a beautiful protection over the Roman army. If one of those shields was down, then all those left around it were left vulnerable. That's the picture that's in this passage. 
A community of faith lives together according to God's word. That's what gives it unity and safety. And if one will not leave it, live according to those standards, then it impacts the internal safety of the church. And you've seen that impact, too, in the sexual scandals. That also affects the morale of the church, too, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And if one won't live according to those standards, it also impacts the reputation of the church. That vessel that we're a part of then becomes tarnished in the eyes of the world. So sometimes the rebuke is in order, as uncomfortable as it sounds. A second thing that the church is to do is to encourage the timid. That Greek actually means one who is little-souled, and it refers to those who have difficulty believing. Now, it doesn't refer to people who refuse to respond to the word. Rather, these people are like a a dear friend who had such trouble believing that he was beloved in God's sight. Or others who have felt like they could never be forgiven. See, rebuke would be the wrong tactic there. Encouragement, rather, is what's needed, right? A third is to help the weak. And that often refers to those who are being tempted and struggling to do what's right. I once preached a sermon on temptation, and someone actually created an email name but tempted. And they they wrote to me about a very real struggle that they were facing. And so we emailed back and forth several times over the next week until that specific temptation was passed. I never heard from them again, and I don't know who it was to this day. That's that's almost neat. Um, But that's the essence of this command is what I was doing via email, coming coming alongside someone, serving as a crutch, if you will, until they are able to walk past those things which will hinder their walk with Christ. Again, do those things make sense? Thank you. I knew you knew that. Overall, as a church, our primary challenge is to be patient. Doing those things is necessary so that everyone has what they most need in order to grow spiritually. To those things, Paul adds what should be obvious. Don't try to get even with each other. Oh, duh. And do try to be kind to one another, both to each other and to others who are not part of the church. Can you see how those things together would make the church a place of safety and a place of invitation? In verses 16 through 18, Paul writes of attitudes to cultivate as a church. And remember, he's writing to a very young community of faith who was undergoing some major suffering. He writes, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in every circumstance. Why those three things? Well, I've read that they're a recipe for mental health because they refocus our attention. They remind us that we have a choice in how we're going to respond to any given situation. We also have a way to handle it and someone to handle it with, right? And in choosing to give thanks, we consider that there may be a very different perspective from that which is visible. And we trust that God is working out all things even when we can't see it. Someday I'm going to preach more on that. Paul does this continually for the Thessalonians all through this letter. Christ is coming back. Keep your focus on him. Let these things be. You be at peace. Lastly, he gives instruction to us as a church. And these gifts will help you, he says, if you use them correctly. Don't quench the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work in each one who knows Christ. As long as that's the Spirit that's reigning in each, we will stay together in unity and at peace with one another. That way we move together when he says move. We say we go when he says go and we follow even when we're moving into new and unfamiliar places because outposts are meant to extend their sphere of influence, aren't they? Second, he says don't despise prophecy. Prophecy is a now word given to the church. It usually highlights a particular word of God giving direction, sometimes bringing rebuke other times offering assistance, on occasion a much-needed word of comfort. Those words are from the Holy Spirit who still speaks to his church, which means he's right here among us, doesn't it? That means we should expect to hear from him, doesn't it? Because the enemy counterfeits the things of God, we need to test any word that is given, particularly if it's one of direction, and the test is really simple. Does it conform to the word of God? End of story. All of these things, 
The integrity in which we live, the way we choose to live together in love, the way we treat each other, help us individually and collectively shine as vessels of Christ. These things that Paul writes help us bear that responsibility well so that not only can we withstand the scrutiny of the world, and it's watching, but we can beckon others to join us as representatives of Christ because one day he is going to return and we want to be found ready, don't we? Okay. Let's take just a moment and consider those things and then we're going to join together in singing a couple of verses of Take Time to Be Holy.